Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, just to let you know, today we have a really special guest, Fred. We call him Big Fred. He was a colonel in the United States Marine Corps. And today we're going to be talking about his adventures at war, what's it like, his background. He's a recipient of three bronze stars and one purple heart. And we're going to talk about that purple heart and see how he, how he achieved that. We also have his daughter next to him, who's going to be the daughter of a veteran of war to see what her perspective was and see what it was like knowing her dad was at war. So let's start this, and we'll start with saying hello to Fred. <laughs> Good morning. Thank Good morning. you, Fred. And, and hello to Catherine. And hello you to Catherine. To, yes, Catherine Fagan. When, when he got this power on your right, you get intimidated a little exactly. bit. Exactly. You know? I, I wasn't trying to Because he's, he's the real deal. He's the real deal. This like, is, all those movies you see. Right. All the movies we love. All those Clint Eastwood movies, <laughs> yeah. Hacksaw They're Ridge and all like that. Clint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's it. like the real Clint Eastwood, <laughs> what yeah, they a, make the movies after. Man. So one of the things, I, and he also is, was a swim coach, so I, I want to talk to him about, you know, we're, later we're going to talk about swim coach. Can you imagine having a drill instructor, a colonel, uh, telling you to oh, swim yeah. laps? Yeah, <laughs> and then screaming at you, and then yeah. jumping in the pool and competing with you. You will not drown! Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so. Throw some more weights on him. Right. <laughs> So I guess, I, you know, we always like to start at the beginning. One of the things I read that I, th I found was really interesting is not only your dedication to our country and to the Marines, but your dedication as a husband. You were married and met your wife at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, what was that like and how'd you meet her? Well, we went to school together. Mm -hmm. We met in, when I was in the seventh grade, eighth grade. She was in the seventh. <laughs> we went all through high school together, started dating when I was in the 11th and she was in the 10th, and uh, even when I was at the Naval Academy and she was at Ole Miss, uh, that relationship endured. And so as soon as I graduated, we graduated, uh, we got married and never looked back. It was a wonderful, wonderful marriage. Beautiful. And, and that was 44 years, huh? Or about? Uh, and when she died, I think it was 53 years we had 50, been married. 53. Yeah. And did you know, so you're in high school, mm -hmm. and you're, you're in love, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, what did you think? Uh, I feel like joining the Marines, or how did that happen? Well, no, actually, uh, when I finished high school, um, I thought that um, I wanted to look and find a better education. I, I just thought if I went to a normal school, I would be one of many thousands of young people graduating with a degree. I wanted something special. And so the service academies came to mind when I was in my senior year in high school. How old were you? 17? How old was I? Yeah. 18, I, 18, I guess, when yeah. I was a, in high, a senior. And so one thing led to another, and, and pretty soon I found myself at the Naval Academy, and it turned out to be all that I could ever have hoped for. Uh, and I graduated four years later with a Bachelor of Science in Engineering and um, grew tremendously during those four years. I'm sure everyone does uh, in college, but I did especially and uh, was commissioned in the Marine Corps and went from there. I have a question. So when you're in the, the Naval Academy, at what point do you say, I want to go in the Navy or I want to go in the Marines? Good question, Mark. Uh, in my case, it was uh, late in my first class year, in the fall of my first class year, when I made service selection. That means you're a senior when yeah. you're first class. A senior. senior year. Okay. Now they do it uh, a year earlier. The, the, the midshipmen choose late in their junior year, second class year, about their service selection. Do, do they have a choice between the Marines, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Army? No. No, they do not. There, tell, there can be. Tell the story how you decided. When okay, there yeah. Can, there can be special yeah. cases, but generally speaking, Naval Academy graduates can go into either the Marine Corps or the Navy, and the Marines can take one sixth of the graduating class because we are essentially one sixth the size of the Navy. Okay. Catherine mm -hmm. mentioned how I decided to come into the Marine Corps. Uh, as a midshipman, I quickly decided that I wanted to be like the guys in green, the <laughs> Marines, <Right. laughs> rather than the guys in blue, the Navy. 
But I was really um, turned off by the fact that if I went into the Marine Corps, <clears throat> I'd just throw away my Navy, essentially throw away my Navy uniforms and have to spend about $1,000 buying Marine Corps uniforms. Mm. And coming from a relatively poor background, that was intimidating to me. So over Christmas leave, before I made my service selection, I talked to Ethlin's father, my future father-in-law, <laughs> who was really a... Uh, surrogate father to me and and his advice was well fred i don't think i'd let a thousand dollars determine what i'm going to do for the rest of my life mm -hmm. a thousand bucks is really not that big a deal Sharp you should you should go where your heart takes you so that convinced me to go into the marine corps and as i say never look back I, fred i have to say the Marines have really nice uniforms, <laughs> and I don't know what be, I don't know how I would be able to wear the all white uniforms and have any kind of a meal without spilling half of it all over myself. That's always you know a, what I mean. That's always a concern. You've got to be so careful. About, Did you hear that the Navy is just now allowing? I saw that. Yeah, their officers and and cadets or to put their hands in their pockets. Yeah. They were never allowed to put their hands in their pockets. I saw that. Why, yeah. why would they not allow them to put their hands in their pockets? It's pocket? unmilitary. Yeah. You don't look very squared away if Disrespect. you're walking around with your hands in your pockets. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. the, the, the rule in those days was, in fact, I knew I knew people who would sew up the pockets right. On, right. on their Just trousers. So they'll make mistakes. So, yeah, you're right. going to make exactly. mistakes. But um, it may be an uh, antiquated... Uh, Rule, I don't know. It's not that big a deal. You know, the sun's going to come up in the morning one way or the other. Reminds me of that story about attorneys. It was so cold yesterday. I, I saw an attorney with his hands in his own pockets. <laughs> 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 so, <Yeah. laughs> oh, so going back, you, you mentioned that he was a surrogate dad. So what was it like Were you growing up? Where was your dad? Let's don't get into that. <laughs> yeah. my, my growing up days were difficult, and my father was um, uh, not a good example for children. Right. Let's leave it at that. Yeah. We may have similar backgrounds. That's why I wanted exactly. to tap into yeah. that. It always, it always, you know, Mark and I went into martial arts and bike, but we had a lot of hidden aggression, you know? And, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Dude, like, yeah. So I'm thinking like Marines, karate guys, it's like there's a lot of hidden aggression. Oh, yeah. Way deep. Like you, you don't even want to talk Every about time it. I look at a belt, I duck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or anything else in the house. Exactly. Get thrown at you. Well, I have this vision. I know I wasn't there, but of even before the 11th grade, but like the 7th grade when he was the paper boy at my mom's grandmother's house. Is that right, Dad? Right. Yeah. Yep. And he would just drop the paper off in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and she'd wave, hey, Fred. <laughs> and sometimes I'd get <clears throat> off my bike. That was the last house on my route, oddly enough. <laughs> and so it was a very convenient, if I didn't have to go to baseball practice, park my bike on the sidewalk and walk up on the steps and sit down and visit with Ethan. So that, that says a lot about your character because at a very young age, oh, yeah, yeah. you were working, correct? Mm, yes, you did not, you weren't a slacker, even as a five or six or seven-year-old. Well, it was out of necessity. I, I started delivering groceries when I was like in the fourth grade. Uh, no, Ten and, years old. Yeah, yeah and, and so uh, that graduated to delivering papers, and that led to uh, the work at the cleaning, the laundry. And then I went to the tire recap shop. While I was a senior in high school and my year of college at uh, Southern Mississippi, so so you you went into the Marine Corps with work ethics. Yes, I certainly did. Right. Yeah, I wish that a lot of the kids today would have some of those same ethics instead of just spending hours looking at their phone and staying inside their home houses eating Cheetos and whatever they you do. You make a terrific point, Mark, because that's what attracted me to the Marine Corps. I was accustomed to hard work. I didn't know anything else. Right. And, and the, the Marines said, don't bother coming to us if you want to read a book or listen to the radio or go to the movie. If you want to be challenged and have to prove yourself, then we'll take you. And so that kind of an attitude um, attracted me. I was accustomed to it. And so 
That's why I say— Are the Marines getting— because of all this wokeness going on, are the Marines getting a little bit softer on how they treat their was, recruits? I'm not in a very good position to answer that, Mark, but I don't think so. If I read between the lines and all the publications and stuff, uh, it, it appears to me that the Marines are maintaining their position of only high school graduates, for example. Mm -hmm. All high school graduates. And the reason for that is it indicates that a young person can stick to it. And he'll right. work hard, he mm -hmm. or she yeah. will work hard to accomplish a goal. Well, that's the kind of guy or gal we want to see in the Marine Corps. So uh, the short answer is I'm not sure, but the longer answer is no, I don't think so. Colonel, when you graduated, determined you wanted to go into the Marines, at what point was did you start hearing about potentially going into a war and and Vietnam, and when did that happen? Well, uh, uh, immediately upon graduation, I went to Quantico for about six months' worth of training, as all Marine officers do. And about halfway through that period, this would have been January 65, let's say, ah. uh, there was uh, a lot of talk about what's going on in this place called Vietnam, and we were all getting accustomed to that because it was so, so new. Uh, by the time I graduated in March, I knew that the Marines had landed at Da Nang in Vietnam. Well, I had been assigned to the 1st Marine Brigade in Hawaii. So we thought we were going to go out there and have three wonderful years in Hawaii <laughs> and everything was going to be great. I knew that the brigade had deployed and had already gone to Vietnam. But I didn't tell Ethlin that. And in, right. in retrospect, that was probably a mistake. Anyway, we get to Hawaii, we fly out there, get to Hawaii, and this lieutenant picks us up in a pickup truck. And he, she and I are sitting in the back, he's up in the front, and we're driving over to um, uh, the brigade headquarters. And the lieutenant turns around and says, well, I hope, I know y'all are glad to get here and, you, and you're looking forward to enjoying Hawaii, but don't get too accustomed to it because the brigade is gone He's going to be gone within two or three days, oh and, and you are going to be uh, getting accustomed to Hawaii all by yourself. Well, Ethan just burst into tears, and so that, that was a traumatic experience for the two of us. Right that in the car? They said in, that? Yeah, in the car. That's, That's how they break it to well, you? Well, the lieutenant did. Right. He didn't have a clue. Right. You know, he was just like me. He was brand new, brown bar, and um, I guess he thought he was uh, pulling a trick on us or something, but... Ethlin sure didn't think yeah. it was a trick. Right. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, two of our other friends uh, were there also. Their wives were there. So the three ladies got together, rented a place. Uh, the three guys took off, and um, they made it work. What do you mean took off? You went? To we went to Vietnam. <clears throat> okay, where did you, where was your? Three days later? Well, it wasn't three days. In this case, it was six. Yes. But uh, oh we, we boarded six. a ship. Yeah. We boarded a ship and uh, took off for Wait, wait, Vietnam. wait. So what month is this? Like this you got married in June. We got married in June of 64. This is now April or May of 65. Oh, my gosh. So you've been married a year, and all of a sudden you're getting deployed. Right. And your wife stays back and goes, I thought we were going to stay in Hawaii for three years. What's going on? What right. did I sign right. up for? Yeah. When you landed in Vietnam... What happened after that? Did, were, were there already uh, combats going on, skirmishes? Yes, there, there was. I, I was assigned initially to 4th Marine Headquarters, the, to the command post, uh, basically to give me about a two-week period to become acclimatized because mm -hmm. the, the humidity and the heat was something that we just weren't accustomed to. Uh, after that, I was assigned after about two, two and a half weeks where, by the way, our command post was attacked on several occasions. Nothing big, but, uh, you know, bullets flying overhead, all that kind of thing. Um, after that period... <laughs> Nothing big, just a bullet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, give me some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> just an AK round flying right. past yeah, my right. head, no well, big deal. It, yeah, that's, right. that's, that I was assigned to uh, 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, and given a rifle platoon, and so I began my combat duty. So I want to ask you something. When you're there and you've been through all the training, and I'm sure you did live fire rounds, but what's it really like when an enemy 
is trying to take your life when as soon as you land, you start hearing bullets whizzing over your head. Does it become real or are you so accustomed to the training that you just get into the mode? That's a tough question, Frank, um, because when it first occurred to me there in the command post, I had no real responsibility except to serve as a watch officer in the CP. So I was mainly concerned about me, old Watash. Right. Now, uh, several weeks later, uh, I've got a rifle platoon, and I'm responsible for about 45 young men, their lives. And so when the rounds start flying, uh, I'm not thinking about me. I'm thinking about them. Mm -hmm. and, and how do we uh, deploy or move or maneuver to accomplish the mission that we've been assigned? So now I'm not thinking about me anymore. I'm thinking about the mission and the men mm -hmm. in, in that order, the mission and the men. There's a movie called The uh, Band of Brothers. When you get a relationship like that, are these, do these guys become like your, your best friends, your family, uh, or do you keep it separate to, to make sure like if one of them falls, you don't go into shock or something? Uh, again, that, that's, yeah, that's a, a very, very good question. Uh, the answer is the leader has to maintain some kind of distance. You, right. you can't get emotionally and overly involved with your troops. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, when you have shared that kind of danger and those kind of responsibilities and that kind of mission, uh, it tends to bring you together. You, you get close. You get really, really close. Right. And um, uh, th there's a, there's a uh, I wanna, don't want to call it love exactly because it's not love, but it's a, uh, it's a feeling of linked together. We are all in this together, and we've got to pull together if we have any sense of wanting to come through this in one piece. How did you feel about being married, knowing that you just got married to the, the woman of your dreams, mm -hmm. and you're, you have bullets whizzing? Was there any guilt, like, if I can't die because my, I'll let my wife down? Did you ever have I, that? I, or, I, no? I never thought about that. That was out of no, your head. That, I just did not think about I mean, not, not to say I didn't think about my wife. I thought about her constantly, particularly right. in those quiet moments when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, right. you know, that kind of thing. But um, uh, I, I didn't think, when, when we were uh, in, in action, uh, Eflin was the last thing on my mind. And yeah. when, how long did it take before you're really in action? When you first landed, you're getting a couple bullets, your, your, your center's getting attacked, not that big. When did, when did it turn up where, okay, we, we are just combat vets. We're going out. We're doing missions, and this is heated now. There's no more f small rounds. Well, as soon as I took over that rifle platoon, uh, I began to participate in the activities that our company and our battalion uh, participated in. I, I ran combat patrols. I ran ambush patrols. I coordinated the frontline defenses along our perimeter. Uh, so... I would say after I arrived in Vietnam, it was probably two and a half, three weeks before I actively began participating in daily and nightly combat operations. Uh, what, at what point did you find out that these guys have an intricate tunnel set, uh, system? Because I, I heard that when the Marines would get into jungle warfare and just, you know, even if you drop a napalm to clear, I heard. We, we don't know who to shoot at. And then you figured out there was a tunneling system. And that, were you there when they discovered that, or was that discovered before you landed? Um, I believe this is a guess, but I would say it would be probably uh, midsummer, late summer of 65, in other words, two or three months after I joined my platoon, that we began to find out that there's a lot of stuff going on underneath our right, feet right. that we didn't know about before. Right. And we, we would find these tunnels. And we quickly learned that smoke was one way to uh, smoke them out. Smoke them out. That's right. right. And, and, and the smoke would also uh, oh, yeah. come up From in the their breathing tubes, holes right. and ventilation tubes. Right. Uh, then after that, we learned that using tear gas was an even better way. Right. Because if there it were there. enemy soldiers, VC, NVA, in those tunnels, they couldn't stand. They could stand the smoke, right. but they couldn't stand the tear gas. Right. And so uh, it was an evolution. I remember 
several occasions, maybe three, where I decided as the lieutenant I needed to go down into tunnels and explore them because I was asking my troops to do it. Right. Well, I'm not a small guy, right. and, and th- those tunnels were not meant for me. But I did it anyway because I just felt like uh, set the example. Lead you by know? example. It lead by example. Right. Uh, but I only did it a few times, and uh, uh, it was uh, a very unsettling uh, experience. Right. So you mentioned that you were in a rifle brigade? Rifle platoon. Ri- rifle platoon. So it's my understanding in World War II, they used an M1 carbine. Mm-hmm. And then in Vietnam, they changed to an M- M16. M16. M4- well, the M14 first. Then the M16 later. But there were some complications or some things going on. Were there, were there challenges with you th- using that, that you didn't have the 30-round capability? You only had 16, were there, and they had 30-round AKs that w- in a firefight, did they work? Or were you like, hey, man, these things are just not working? Because I've heard stories both ways. Well, th- th- there's, th- that's a complicated question, Mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, it's not how many rounds you expend. It's those rounds whether they hit or not. We used to say in the Marine Corps, hits count. The rest of it is horse hockey. Mm-hmm. So putting out a lot of rounds, spraying an area, doesn't really do much as a rule. Um, the M14, as I recall, had something like uh, eight rounds in the, in the magazine. Right. Maybe it was ten, uh, which was... Okay. I mean, uh, it, it couldn't compete firepower-wise with the AK, but we had a much longer range. Right. The M14 was good for at least 500 yards. Oh, that's the good. Pro- the problem was, in jungle warfare, you don't, you don't need have to 500 shoot 500 right. yards. Correct. You're, you're talking 25, 50 at most. Right. And so uh, that, that's a, something to consider. To, to go to the M16, where there were definitely problems with the M16 uh, initially. They later cleaned it up and fixed it. But um, I was never part of a situation where my troops were uh, killed or wounded because their M16s didn't work. Uh, it, it just, I was lucky, maybe. Good. But, but there were occasions, I know, where the M16 malfunctioned and our troops had to pay the price. Do they have a, you got an M16 with a 45? Did you got, did, did everyone have sidearms? Or did you just issue an well, M16? Well, the, the, the uh, officers carried 45 pistols. Right. Um, and, and many uh, would uh, also carry rifles of one sort right. or another. Uh, I remember my gunny, uh, Gunny Malloy, uh, told me one time, he said, Skipper, you can carry that damn rifle if you want to, but you're just lugging around an awful lot of weight. Right. You ain't being paid to shoot a rifle. You're being paid to use your brain. <laughs> so so let's forget about the rifle. If, if, if we get ourselves in a shit sandwich and you need a rifle, right. you'll be able to pick it up. Right. There'll, there'll be some laying on the ground. Right. You... you uh, uh, Use your head right. and, and let the leave the shooting to us. That was very good advice. Mm-hmm. Fred, let me ask you a question. This may be another question you don't want to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You obviously were in combat. Do you remember your first kill? Yes. And and did was that – what did that do? Did that – was it exhilarating? Was it, oh, God, this is real? Or was it like just keep going? Because your mind must have been spinning. Well, it was, and, and um, it was more of a situation, well, that's done. Right. Where do we go from here? What's the right. next step? We got that guy out of the way. Now right. let's uh, go find the rest of them or right. something. I didn't, exhilaration was the furthest thing from my mind. I, I, I just viewed that guy as a, an enemy soldier right. who was trying to do to me what I just did to him. First, right, mm-hmm. exactly. It's a mission. Mission, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Yeah. And what are some of the things that you saw in the war that they had? Because I know they had their weapons, but uh, did they use booby traps, fire, like what? everything, right? No question about right. it. Their, their ingenuity, right. their, their ability to take just about anything and usefully use it in the pursuit of what they were trying to do. Right. Booby traps is a very, very good example. Can you imagine 
finding a 250-pound bomb or a 150-millimeter artillery round that didn't explode when it hit the ground. And so you dig that Hummer up, and you convert it into a booby trap. IED. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's right. 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 But uh, I can remember seeing sea ration cups, cans, sea ration cans. We never thought about this. But if you took a grenade, a U.S. grenade, pulled the pin, and then slipped it down into that um, sea yeah. ration cup, the cup would hold the spoon so the spoon couldn't fly. And then you would tie a wire or a string onto the head of the grenade tied across the trail. So somebody comes down that trail, hits the string, right. pulls the grenade out, the spoon flies, and it explodes. Perfect little booby trap. Right. I mean, but, but gee whiz, the, 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 their ability. Right. To, they did that or you they, guys did oh, that? Oh, they did it. They right. did that time and time and time again. At, at the time you were in combat, from what I understand, they used a lot of mines. Mm -hmm. And then people who would step on them if – Click. Click. And then Don't step they would, off. They, but then if they were – other soldiers in that vicinity, because there's a certain blast radius, they would have to have walk to. away. So, uh, when maybe. somebody would would step on one of those, would they warn everybody else and say, "Hey, I just stepped on them," or or would you well, would everybody just happen? hear it and go, "Duck"? Well, that, that, yeah, that's, that's movie a, stuff. That's a tough question, uh, Mark, because uh, what you describe is pretty much the way it would happen. We, uh, in my war, uh, mostly were concerned with bouncing Bettys, which right. were an old World War II type thing. It would pop up and explode about waist high and, and would uh, just uh, uh, inflict terrible damage on a number of people. Right. Right. Um, but I was much more concerned with booby traps in mines. I, th th many of the mines were laid indiscriminately by the French or by the Viet Minh or by the North Vietnamese. And with the passage of time, people would forget where they were and okay. it didn't have a jungle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't find them. And so, um, <clears throat> as luck would have it, mines were not an overriding concern for me in the way that booby traps were. Because we met booby traps all the time. What about other what about other hazards such as they call it jungle rot, like your feet get messed up, mosquitoes, leeches, leeches malaria. snakes, malaria, malaria. All like, of did that. they give you medication when you went out there? Was there even malaria medication at the time? There was. Uh, unfortunately, I had both dengue fever on my first tour and malaria on my second tour. Jeez. <laughs> uh, I stepped on a, 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 a punji steak on what, my first tour. What's a punji steak? Punji steak is a sharpened bamboo. Yeah, I was going to ask him about bamboo booby traps. Which are, which are placed into a small hole in the ground, maybe six or eight or ten sharpened bamboo stakes wow. in this bottom of the hole. The hole is covered with a thin bamboo uh, mat, mat yeah. and then dirt placed on top of it on a trail. So the Marines would come down the trail, step on the mat, it would fall through, and the punji stakes would impale your foot. Right, your through, right through leg. your boots? Right, right, right through. Ooh. Well, see, but later we, we put a steel oh, um, uh, flank, uh, right, thing it's on the— uh, A shank. A shank, shank yeah. yeah, steel shank. And, and that uh, really did away with the effectiveness of the punji stakes. But early in that first tour, it's they were a real bottom. problem. So you— Actually took one in the foot. Yes. How far did it go in? Not that far. Oh. So, uh, did it, you? It, it actually went in just near my ankle. It didn't go into my foot. Right. I, I oh. took it on the side. And okay. so that gave you dengue fever? Well, no. Dengue fever, like malaria, was caused by mosquitoes. mosquitoes. Okay. And we did have, as you asked earlier, we did have medication that we took to prevent that kind of thing. And I religiously took mine. Some people hard heads that they were, cho chose not to take the medications. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, malaria pills and the, um, the pills that we took to purify water, what was it called? Oh, yeah. Can't think of it. Think, think of the moment. Oh. But it was supposed to work, and, and I think by and large did. Unfortunately, I got sick both times and uh, 
had to go to the hospital for a short period. Was there anything in the jungle you could eat that they taught you in your in your uh, training that, hey, if you ever get stuck or you're running away or you lose your platoon, survival skills? I don't know if you chew on bamboo like a panda bear. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall that, uh, yeah. Frank. I, I don't recall about anything uh, li- like that, no. Okay. But you learned how to make a good pudding. You had all these recipes of your MREs Well, all that yeah, stuff when, when there could, was time. There, there was a <laughs> thousand different ways to mix up our sea rations to try to make them more enjoyable or at least palatable. Who, who was the president that said, you know, how long is it going to take? We're going to go over there and fight some guys in pajamas. Remember, and he underestimated Johnson. Was Probably John- Johnson. 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 Yeah. And were there for, were there a formidable fight? Wasn't it? I mean, these guys weren't didn't seem like to be uh, wimpy battlemen. These guys were into it, or was it? No, they 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 were fighting for their lives, and they had been fighting for decades. Years, right. I mean, remember this began after World War II and was still going on when we got there in uh, the mid '60s. So. Uh, so they may have been farmers. The VC may have been farmers during the day, but at night they turned into fighters, and they knew what the hell they were doing. Um, uh, they they could not. The VC, generally speaking, could not uh, muster a large force, but they could put together thirty men and, and do some damage at whatever they chose to do. I remember in my second tour, uh, we uncovered the 141st NVA Regimental CP deep in the um, uh, mountains uh, ch- west of Da Nang at Charlie Ridge. And we found an awful lot of stuff that the intelligence people just went nuts over. They came out there in droves to see what they could see in this huge regimental command post. But one of the things that struck me so vividly they had these hand-drawn maps, sheets of paper like this size, three feet wide, three feet deep, long. And they had detailed drawings of the position that they were going to attack. And they showed the one element coming in this way, another element coming in that way, uh, mortars uh, to be employed as the forces convened. I mean, th- their planning was just... Uh, uh, to the nth degree, it really was. Wow. So you're walking around in Vietnam and you come across a village. I guess you'd call it a village. Mm-hmm. And there's guys out there. I guess there were rice paddies, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. The guy's a farmer. Mm-hmm. Looks like just some regular dude. Did you look at that person and go, oh, you're not a farmer. Hmm. You're, you're going to be you a see. farmer until about 8 or 9 o'clock tonight. And then you're going to do some damage. Did that ever, did that happen? That happened all the time. It happened all the time. But but what you could not afford to do is treat that farmer out there in his rice paddy like an enemy. Mm-hmm. You couldn't do that. You, you had to get some kind of evidence that this guy was one of the bad guys. Mm-hmm. Because most of the v- Vietnamese people, all they wanted to do was farm their little piece of ground, live in peace, raise their children. Right. Those who were uh, VC would infiltrate with the normal people and try to hide amongst them. So what we would do is rather than pick out the uh, males, we would go into the village and then search it out, looking for some kind of evidence that so-and-so was a potential enemy like finding a rifle, finding military gear, finding... Um, uh, maps. Maps, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Booby trap material. Now now we've got something to go on. Mm-hmm. But that, that doing that was a whole lot easier said than done. Oh, yeah. Right, no kidding. Did you have a translator with you while you were... Yes, I did. And those, those translators, did any of them ever turn out to be on the other side and turn on you? Not in my case. But, but uh, I, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that did not happen because the South Vietnamese forces were infiltrated right. by turncoats. I call them turncoats. Yeah. They would prefer to see themselves as uh, uh, countrymen, freedom, countrymen, yeah. freedom, freedom fighters. Freedom fighters, fighters kind of yeah. Uh, uh, many of the translators were, in fact, turncoats from the North Vietnamese or the VC. 
we called them Chew Hoys. And uh, my Chu Hoy, or Kit Carson, was a former North Vietnamese who had Chu Hoyed and yeah. t- come over to our side. And he, he stayed with me almost my entire second tour as a uh, translator, as an interpreter, as a uh, uh, someone who could, who could uh, make a pretty good guess about what the enemy was trying to do or going to do, et cetera. You know what I find very ironic about war, Germany, Japan, Vietnam, these are countries that we bombed severely. Now we go to Japan and hang out in, ja- in Japan. Germany, we're importing all their cars. Vietnam, you can get a nice bike tour now of Vietnam. When, you're, when you fight for the country like you did and then you see people here that you know, not all of them were on the same team. Do you ever think to yourself, this is kind of strange? Like, like we were at war and now we made peace. Why didn't we just settle this thing a different way? Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Well, you, it's a very complicated question, right. Mark. Uh, but uh, the first part is no. I, I, I don't look back and say I hate that person or I, I wish that sorry son of a gun would go back to Vietnam right. and leave us here. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not an emotional-ridden thing like that. He, he believed in what he was doing. I believed in what I was doing. We went at it. Uh, we hmm. got it over with, so it's over and done with. Right. Put it okay. behind us. Let's go on. Like a good fight. You know, mm-hmm. Shake hands and... But yeah, you see on. these wars, these endless wars. And, and what I found ironic, because Frank and I, during that Vietnam era, we would... I was in sixth grade, probably in the... Um, I was born in 61, so 75, what would that make me? 14. 14. Yeah. Or 68, I was seven or eight or nine because I remember watching Walter Cronkite. And every night Walter Cronkite would say, in Vietnam, this many North Vietnamese were killed. And it was always some – Three soldiers. And three (laughs) soldiers. But this guy, Walter Cronkite, kept acting like we're getting our asses kicked all Mm -hmm. the time. But from other vets that I've talked to, they tell me we were doing pretty good. So what, what's the truth here? Well, again, truth is in the eye of the beholder, first right. of all. Uh, in, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many who were involved, we won almost every single battle. And Tet, the 68, is a very good example. We right. kicked their ass that- up one side and down the other. But that's not the way it was perceived in the United States. It right. was a distinct victory for the other side. Um, and, and again, I, uh, truth is in the eye of the beholder. Um, I don't know Cronkite's um, uh, motivations, but certainly he was a, a voice that the American people respected greatly, and his opinion mattered. Um, but again, I will go to my grave believing that we, in essence, defeated the Vietnamese on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. We did not defeat them in the area of public opinion. Right. And that's what, in the end, made the difference. The, so, t- the Tet Offensive. Yeah, that's, go ahead. Okay, I was the Tet talk Offensive, about that. that's when, that was the New Year, so everyone uh, laid down their arms thinking that they would celebrate their New Year's. Exactly. We're not, that's we're not, exactly yeah, right. We're not going to have any battle. We can kick back. And then, mm-hmm. were you there? So No, I, okay. I, 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 I was there the next year when there was another offensive, but okay. not to the degree that the 68 one was. Right. So that probably woke up everyone saying, we're not going to put our guns down anymore, well, it, New it, it, Year's or not. Th- that is a, a point that many people fail to realize, that the deal was on both sides, right. the, the South Vietnamese and the Americans and the North Vietnamese, okay, we're going to lay them down for right. this six-day period. Right. Uh, soldiers can go home on leave, see their families, right. and we'll start fighting again in next week. Well, it didn't happen right. that way. Yeah. So you're you're a recipient of two bronze stars, correct? Three, three bronze stars, mm-hmm. and a purple heart. So, 
you don't get three bronze stars for one thing. It has to be three different things. Mm -hmm. They don't just go, you get three. Well, how do you get a brown star? That's bronze the, star. That's my next, that's my question. Can you talk about how you got these three bronze stars? Um, What's the definition of getting a bronze versus purple? Or I don't think there's a, well, a purple heart is where you get wounded yeah, you or get shed, shed, you shed, shed your blood, blood right, in, in, in defense combat. of your country, in combat. The, the uh, awards for valor are, there, there's no criteria, right. uh, to my knowledge. Uh, what happens is uh, an individual does something in combat, uh, his peers or his superiors uh, feel like uh, that's recon uh, va uh, worthy of recognition. Right. And so the action is written up and submitted up the chain, and then uh, there are uh, boards or there are institutions in the system that will review that documentation and say, okay, this is worthy of a silver star or gotcha. a Navy cross or whatever. And the decision is made way up the line uh, so that there is some, some means of, um, of continuity, I guess right. is the word I'm looking for. So you got three of them. Yes. So Okay, so it goes up the chain of command. Mm -hmm. They go, hey, this Fred guy, <laughs> look, at, look at this guy's story. What would one of those stories be? Well, it would. It, what you get them for? You you get it for doing more than than would normally be expected. So it's not just like one thing. You went there and saved twenty people and came out. This is more like in general. Hey, these guys pushed further. They did more than uh, we expected. It, I would say it, it, it's hard to categorize, Frank. Right. Okay. Exactly, but more often than not, those. Combat Valor Awards are awarded for a specific single incident. Now, there may be times like um, uh, Jay Vargas and um, uh, General Richardson who were involved over a three-day period in Daido, uh, uh, a terrible battle where they uh, performed heroic actions several times over a period of three days. And so their award citation reflects that. But generally speaking, the award citation is concerned about one specific incident where an individual might do more than one thing, but it was in, in, involved a single occurrence of battle. So the Purple Heart, we talked about it, shedding blood for mm -hmm. there, uh, and you received it. So what happened there? Did you shed some blood? Well, yeah, I, uh, I was hit by fragments uh, uh, on more than one occasion. I didn't think that they were... Uh, fragments of what? Grenades, grenades, yeah. grenades and mortar shells. So you had to be close. Oh, yeah. If someone's throwing a grenade at you, oh, you're, you like you're right there. Right. Yeah. Within throwing 30 a, foot. Within throwing a rock. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like throwing That's a big rock. No yeah. fun. So, so, you, so <laughs> you see the enemy. No How fun. weird. You see a guy. Do you, do you watch him throw it or do you, do you know he threw it? Or? Well, in, in my case, it was yeah. at night. So right. oh. the, we knew they were close. We were, we were trying close. to con constrict our perimeter and, and keep them out of the perimeter. But uh, we were throwing. They were throwing. I mean, it, it gets... Uh, Pretty doggone chaotic, particularly at night when you can't see anything. Right. And in so Vietnam, dark. I swear, Vietnam can be the blackest place you've ever seen in this whole wide world. Do they tell you, like, don't smoke any cigarettes at night? Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. Not only that, they can, are the Vietnamese can smell? You know, smell well, Americans, so right? That, that, there were, you can appreciate the rumors that yeah. would fly around, <laughs> but the, the idea I was see. don't smoke. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, when when we would come off an operation, uh, it never ceased to amaze me how all of us in the, in those days I smoked. Well, I mean, I practically ate them for crying out right. loud. But um, everybody was eager to get that first smoke. So the, they had obviously snipers, snipers and trees. Yes. What did you use for uniforms in order for them not to take out the top guy? Did you all dress the same or or about right the o about the only concession I made was I did not wear my rank insignia right. on my lapels. Right, but it's still that that was uh, you know that was like peeing in a wind for goodness right. sake because I always had my radio operator right there with me, Sorry. and he had the radio on his back and either a tape antenna or a whip 
which made him stand out right, like exactly. a green thumb, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, and the guy closest to the radio operator is was, by, by definition, the leader. And so, uh, but that was, uh, you know, that was just uh, the price you paid. I mean, you, you had to live with that. You had to have that radio. Right. This is a, this question I've asked to other Vietnam vets because we've talked to other vets. Are you able to watch movies about Vietnam? Or probably uh, able to do like like Not let's say me. Platoon or Full Metal Jacket or whatever that one movie is. I saw each of them one time, and I have no desire whatsoever to go back and see them again. Uh, it's probably worse now than it was when I was younger. When I was younger and full of piss and vinegar, you know, I, I didn't think about those kind of things. Now, um, I just don't want to go back. I mean, the Platoon in particular was so realistic. I just don't want to see it anymore. Right. right. So that one scene where the guy fell asleep, like I'm sure you're just exhausted. You're standing post. You're exactly right. Like you're just um, – like because we, you, we fall asleep. You know, you're trying to stay up and then – but right. you don't know you fell asleep because right. you fell asleep. deprivation is the worst. Mm. Did those kind of things happen where people would screw up a bit and then cost the no lives question. of a lot of people? Well, I don't know about costing the lives of many people. But when, when you fight your way through that thick jungle all day long right. and then you're in a foxhole with two, three, or four other guys and you split up the night in, into watches, right. uh, it's, it's, it just doesn't take an awful lot to imagine somebody just – giving in to exhaustion mm -hmm. and it happens all it happened all the time no matter how you tried to combat it in other words instead of having just two man foxholes if you had four man foxholes then each guy had to stand a shorter watch right. and therefore only stay awake for a shorter period of time right. and so and that helped but it didn't solve the problem did well, you have claymores Beg your pardon? Did you use the claymores? Oh, yes, very definitely. It, like every night you'd set a perimeter? Uh, not necessarily because so often you got to be as concerned about the back blast of that right. baby just as much yeah. as you do right. the forward end of it. So if you were in a set up in a, in a flat terrain area, you might not have a good opportunity to use the claymores. Right. But, boy, those babies were terrible. I mean, they, they, they were something, especially right. if you were set in an ambush and, and on a trail – and, and you were a little bit higher, so you had some protection from that right. back glass. So in Vietnam, when you're really tired, you have sleep deprivation. Did the military give you any amphetamines that you could take? No. Was there a lot of drug use usage going on because of whether it's marijuana or opium amongst the – I'm probably sure it was amongst the people because they had it there. But, I mean, amongst the U.S. Troops. soldiers – were they doing drugs like you see in some of these? I heard people? I heard so much about that, particularly in my second tour. Um, I found one time a box of Marlboros. You know the box Marlboros. Yeah, red so, box. Yeah. yeah. And and just out of I found it lying in our in our on a hilltop where where, where where my company was, and so I reached down, picked it up, opened it up, and there were. The rows of marijuana cigarettes, except in the middle, there were about, I mean, the, the, the rows of regular store-bought cigarettes, mm -hmm. except in the middle, there were six marijuana cigarettes mm -hmm. placed in that box. And, you know, I, I thought, how did that happen? How, how did somebody, first of all, get their hands on this box of Marlboro cigarettes and then manage to get six marijuana cigarettes right in the middle of the pack? I, I never solved that question. <laughs> yeah. But you, you're right. There was a terrible drug problem in Vietnam. Uh, and I'm sure uh, there was some usage in my company as well. But I think it was minimal. And, and the reason is, and I, I preach this constantly, you can't afford to be a combat Marine and not have all of your facilities present for duty. Right. It's just like being drunk. Would you go on a patrol drunk? No. Of course you wouldn't. No. Would you go on a patrol crazy from drugs? 
you sure as hell better not because you may be in, in, uh, endangering my life, right. not only your own, but right. mine and everybody else as well. And I, I think that was pretty effective. I um, Did you have a good reputation of putting the law down with your yes. troops? I was, I was known as a by-the-book guy. Right. And I was demanding. I was very, very demanding. My thought was, they don't have to love me. They don't even have to like me. But they damn well sure better respect me if I am going to expect to get them to do what I want them to do. Right. Because they're putting their ass on the line. When, right. when, when, when they do what I say, they're, they're, they're putting it. themselves right. on the line. And, and they better know that I got my stuff in one bag. Right. I, I, was, I was fortunate in that regard, Frank, because I was on my second tour, and everybody knew it. I had taught lieutenants at the basic school for two solid years about exactly what we were doing. In fact, in the course of my time as a company commander, I had nine lieutenants who cycled through my company wow. that I had taught at the basic school. So they knew me. Right. And um, I had my shit wired. I really did. And, and the troops knew it. They knew that I had their welfare at heart that I was not some marionette who said, oh, the rules say this, and therefore we're going to do this. I was more inclined to say, well, this is what the rule book says, but in this situation, uh, I'm going to allow preference to the welfare of the men and give them a break so they can rest and get over that sleep deprivation or clean their weapons so they'll be ready to fire tonight or whatever. They just knew that. and Dad, I'm learning so much <clears throat> as I'm listening to you as your own daughter, still learning all the details. But wait, you went for your first tour, and then you were back, and you went back to Quantico, right? Right. Mom came back from Hawaii by herself? Yeah, by just, herself, okay. yeah. But then, so she went to Quantico without you? No, well— when I came back from that first tour, I went to Hattiesburg for leave. Okay, and that's where she that, was. That's where she was. Got it. And then, then y'all moved to Quantico, Quantico, Virginia. Right. So you were at TBS in between your first and second tour exactly. in Vietnam. Exactly. For like a year? Two years. Two years. Did Two you years know almost that, to the day. Did you know you were going to go back on a second tour? Yeah. Uh, I did. Uh, did you want to? No, I didn't particularly right. want to. I'll tell you an interesting story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I got my orders. And, uh, of course, Ethel and I dealt with that. But then when I went to Pendleton en route to Vietnam, my orders got changed, sending me, instead of sending, instead of sending me to the 1st Marine Division in country, I was told to go to Okinawa. Hmm. Well, I didn't like that. And so uh, I called FMF PAC in Hawaii and got the major that cut my orders and ask him to change it, send me back to Vietnam. He said, no, I've already made the decision, you're going. I said, okay. So that night, I called my good friend, Buzz Buse, uh -huh. my, the best friend I had in the world. And I said, Buzz, I know you wouldn't do this for you, but I'm asking you to do it for me. Would you call your dad and ask him to get my orders changed back to Vietnam. So he, <laughs> His dad was CGFMF PAC, okay. uh, Lieutenant General H.W. Buse. He said, you're right. I wouldn't do it for me, but I will for you. <laughs> and so he called his dad that night, and two days later, my orders were changed. Wow. But I, I did. I didn't do that uh, out of... Yeah, like whatever. Like but you know, I, I did it because I knew there was not a another Marine captain in the Marine Corps that was better qualified than I was right. to go to Vietnam and lead troops in combat. Yeah, I, I believe that just so very strongly. Hoorah, Dad! <laughs> Good. So <laughs> when you when you so I got a question. This is you. You came back from Vietnam. And you adjusted to civilian life, mm -hmm. and you did well. Yet there's so many that you see these Vietnam vets. They're homeless. Mm -hmm. They can't get their act together. They PTSD. drinking PTSD. They Drug don't even addiction. have. I don't even think they had that designation. Back no, they then. did. They used to call it different. They used to yeah. call it shell shock. Combat shell shock. Contact, yeah, contact fatigue. fatigue. Correct. So now it's called. So PTSD. why is it that 
Some can handle, some can't. Yes. Why can some people come back and then some people just fell apart? Is it because they saw different? Because everybody probably sees pretty much the same. You're right about that. Everybody sees different things. I I don't have an answer, Mark. I I don't know. I wish I did. If we had an answer, we could solve the problem. Right. Right. But uh, it it, it just breaks my heart to to see these guys uh, that just haven't, for whatever reason, haven't been able to handle it. And, And their lives are in shatters. Uh, because of it, but I certainly don't know the answer. I suspect drugs are at the bottom of it, but I, I don't know that. Mm-hmm. And, and probably uh, it's not fair to say that everybody no. drugs apply. I mean, right. more well, the to, bottom more line, to it than that. The bottom line is people take drugs on different levels, whether it's Excedrin or if it's heroin, to do one thing. Right. And that's to relieve pain. Mm-hmm. The pain mm-hmm. can be psychological, emotional, and when you when you're when you're hurting that heart inside, when you're in a foxhole with your friend and you see him get shot in the head, I'd smoke a joint. Mm. You know, mm. like yeah. like you mm. would consider like I'm done, I'm next. What's life? My best friend just his head blew up in front of me. I would think that would be a good reason to maybe numb yourself, numb yourself from the pain. It's, it's all from pain. But then what happens when you take these opioids or heroin? The body gets they addicted, and yeah. you need more. You mm-hmm. know, so. I do believe that some of these guys are just normal guys. I just picture a guy like Home Depot, and all of a sudden he's 17 years old, jumps off a helicopter, makes it through the first 15 seconds of not getting killed, runs into a jungle, and now he's in combat. How scary is that, especially at night? These are like these are nightmares, you know, like so yeah. dark you can't even light a cigarette because some dude's going to snipe you. Well, you can't even get Imagine, through the jungle. I mean, get, it's right. like a you, we've been it's in jungle. jungle. We've been in jungles. <laughs> yeah. You walk yeah. in and you're like, there's no, you where can't am I see going? <laughs> They're like, can, yeah. where do I go from here? Well, start yeah. cutting shit. I'm like, yeah. what do you, I, am I, I right? You have yeah, to cut yeah. the yeah. stuff. You you're can't like, see anything. Yeah, you're, you're surrounded like by uh, bushes. Yeah. But right. also the, the enemy has, they, they, they didn't wear ghillie suits, but they had, you know, camouflage on their helmet. They look like part of the bush. And you're constantly thinking, I'm either going to hit a tripwire, I'm going to get shot by a sniper, or some guy's going to jump out from three feet away and stab me or shoot me. I can see why. So, I can see why some so people this would is, this is, take drugs. Frank, listen, uh, Fred. I want to ask you this question. We had a Vietnam vet in here, and his job was to call napalm strikes. He would he would cruise the area in a fixed wing first, check it out, and then there was a it was a J. I, I forget what the designation was, but he had a certain designation. Did you in your platoon? Did you have to call napalm strikes and then were you exposed to Agent Orange also? Like was all that stuff – because it kind of all goes together. Don't, let's don't forget, Mark, that question. Let's go back to um, – Taking we drugs about being stressed the, out. The, v, the, the North Vietnamese and the VC in the jungle. Right. Let's don't forget we're fighting on their territory. They know it. They have out. lived there right. their entire right. lives. Exactly. And, and, and that's one of the uh, Advantages. major problems about Vietnam and about the Middle East for that matter. We, a bunch of Caucasians and black guys, are being sent into an environment where we are foreign to the culture. Right. We are foreign to what goes on in that location. Right. And so... It's a awfully big jump to to adapt and become effective and understand what's going on. In a short amount of time. In a very right. short amount of time. Now, to go back, Mark, to what you the, the point you brought up about— um, We hear all these things about if you're exposed to Agent Orange, yeah, call this number. Napalm. And then also, you call an airstrike. Well, what if you're off by— 50 right. yards. Uh, yeah. Like you could well, screw your own guys up. Well, meters. that's right. But, but, but uh, you, excellent point. The thing is, when you, when you use particularly napalm, because it can spread over a right. large area, you want to bring the, and yes, I called in napalm, snakes and nap, all kinds okay. of ordnance hundreds of times. But you want to make sure, particularly using napalm, you bring it across your front. Mm. You don't bring it from front from to rear, rear right. or gotcha. from rear to front. Doesn't make sense. You want right. to lay it down in front of you, right. right? So that when it spreads, it's spreading parallel to where the essence of uh, the bulk of your troops are, and that starts a, a a new front line almost. Well, sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, because when you're when you're going at uh, four hundred knots 
and you're trying to drop something on a dime down there below, exactly. it, it's exceedingly difficult. Now, we didn't have smart bombs in those days. Right. Now they can, they can pinpoint. put it into the mailbox if they want to, or at least that's what right. the government guys would that's like what to they have say. believe. Right. That's um, the arm dealers want you to believe. Buy three of them. <laughs> but, um, yes, I, I called in napalm, all kinds of ordnance. Um, so napalm, just so our viewers, because we have a lot of viewers that don't know what napalm is, uh, explain what that is. Just for It's the jellied viewers. gasoline. Okay. Oh. It's gasoline combined with a jelly-like substance to hold it together. And then in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, container... There is a small explosive charge that will set it off. So when you drop that napalm container and it hits the ground, uh, the explosive charge goes off, igniting the jellied gasoline. And that jellied gasoline will spread, oh, probably 100 yards, 110 yards in a line with about... 30, 40 yards to the side. Right. And it cooks everything that's in there, in that frame. Fred, and, and what, wait, hold on, because we're going, we're going on chemicals. What was Agent Orange? You keep hearing like Agent Orange. Agent what was Orange that? was a terrible, terrible defoliant, which was uh, generally dispensed from airplanes. Big old cargo airplanes right. had these uh, spray nozzles along the wings and they flew low and slow uh, in like formation. Crop dusters. Crop dusters, a right. good example. Uh, dispensing that Agent Orange, which would kill the growth. And, yes, I was exposed to it. Uh, that's why I am um, uh, have got uh, prostate cancer today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a, uh, on, what do they call it, uh, partial disability from the Veterans Administration mm. because of my exposure. I went, I wasn't involved with spraying or putting the packages together. I went in the jungle where it had been sprayed. That's yeah, on you. It's, uh, yes. It's like running through that, yeah. that defoliant that you spray on your yard. I'm not going to mention any brand names because, but you spray it on your grass. Can you imagine spraying that on yourself? Right. So one question I had is the, Helicopter pilots in Vietnam, from what I've been told, didn't have a very long life expectancy, especially in the combat areas. Did you ever have a situation where you were like, we need a helicopter pilot here right now because we got some people we got to evacuate? I'll tell you, they, they, they are, to my, to my way of thinking, they're genuine heroes. I mean, gosh, those things flew so slow and so low, uh, they were sitting ducks. They, they were sitting in that little plastic enclosed uh, mm -hmm. cockpit. Um, they, they were sitting ducks. But, man, they had cojones, I mean to tell you. They really did. And he had that red cross on the side, and people would say that would just be a target to shoot at. <laughs> did, or did they need the red remember, cross? I don't remember okay. red crosses. Oh, okay. I, I don't remember a single oh. one. I, I heard I, there was red crosses. Maybe I'm wrong. I think maybe they, they had them in Korea. Well, it could be they had uh, Red yeah, the Crosses Red Cross on, the, on the birds that flew out to the hospital ship mm -hmm. or something. Or maybe they flew from the hospital at uh, Da Nang down to uh, Benoit or something. I, I don't know. But the helicopters I saw didn't have Red Cross. So some of the people that – sorry, did I cut you off? No, I was going to say one of the tactics I think the Vietnamese used, I want to get your confirmation on this, was it's better to – have one soldier injured, like maybe a mine that would blow up his foot, so two people would have to carry him because that way you're taking out three at a time. Mm -hmm. Did you see them doing stuff like that? Instead of just killing the person, they would just injure him because that would take out three Marines instead of one. Well, I don't know that I, that I saw that uh, in, in the sense that I could say that's what they're doing. Right. But certainly uh, in reading the literature and, and being able to look back and uh, see events in a little bit of a different perspective now – than I did then, uh, it seemed pretty clear that uh, their extensive use of booby traps was designed with precisely that in mind. Right. Injure a few of them and disable a Comes bunch to take bunch, care right. of them. And then yeah. bring in a helicopter to pick them up, then you got a good, you nice gotta, target. Right? Exactly. Some exactly. of the people that weren't really that acknowledged in the Vietnam War were the nurses. So can you give me, tell me about your, since you were injured, 
what's your experience with the women? Well, there's male nurses now, but I'm going to suspect that most of them were women. How how were they? As opposed to corpsmen? I'm not. No, I'm not talking about. Not, I'm not talking about in the field. Okay. I'm saying when you went to the when you were in injured, and then Vietnam, the nurses in Viet, there were nurses in Vietnam. Yes. How did they? How were they looked upon, and how how much did they contribute, and what? Because they probably need a little shout out. Well, to, to my thinking, they were angels. They really yeah, I, were. I, I never had any personal uh, contact with them because when I was evacuated, it was always to either Charlie Med or Delta Med uh, in Chulai or in Da Nang. That's as far as I went. My injuries weren't that extensive. Uh, the, the nurses, I think, were in the major uh, centers like Benoit mm. or on the hospital ship or in Japan or in Okinawa. Uh, they were certainly in country, uh, but the, not at the uh, the hospitalization that, that I went to. So I never saw a female nurse. <laughs> what about the mass units? How close were they set up to to the to the uh, combat zone? Were they pretty easy to set up, or, or were they? Or did they off? have any? Did they have well, any? Mass, ma- it, well, mobile well, army surgical hospitals. Right, but that, I think I know they have them in Korean War. Uh, did they? Uh, did you have any mass units back I then? don't know. Uh, yes. Again, uh, they they. They may have been uh, an Army-specific unit. Right. They may, okay, may have gotcha. been part of the big outfits like Benoit. But um, uh, Da Nang, Chu Lai, Quang Tri, um, I, I don't think we had any mass units. I don't think. I'm not sure. So the Marines were the opposite of what you call in the rear with the gear. You were at, mm-hmm. you were at the forefront. So yes. no wonder you didn't see any of that. I mean, you were the spear of the head. So, so you and your platoon had to go into villages and combat areas that no one else has got there first. Were you the first people to push that forward, or how, how would you determine well, uh, when you it, went in? It, it, you see, it's not like uh, World War II where the war was a moving front. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in Vietnam, you revisited the same places right. mm-hmm. over and over again. What was that, what was that mountain they kept going? Hamburger Hill? Mountain? Was it Hamburger Hill? Hamburger Hill yeah. again. That was a that was a debacle. Right, it really was. And, and see, they gave it up right. a- after all. That's what I said. That, well, kind of like Afghanistan. Yeah, gave it up, and, and uh, um, okay, t- just a tragedy. So after you got out of the war, all this, you're back in civil. You're, you're back in your civilian life. What did you do after that? I'm, the reason why I'm speeding it up because I do want to talk about your 75 miles. Uh, that you are on bicycles and walking, that you journal. So we're going We're going to go pretty fast now. I did want to cover that part of your work because everyone like me who meets a person like you is is awe-inspired, but we're, we're scared to ask you because you heard these <laughs> Vietnam, don't talk about Vietnam. No one talks about that. That's why I wanted to hit it for that section. Well, you, you flatter me, uh, Frank, and I, mm-hmm. I thank you. Mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Um, it started, I think, in um, 73, when I began running marathons. And in those days, it was a question of keeping track of the mileage. You wanted to get 110 to 120 miles a week uh, to prepare for that uh, very stressful 26 miler that right. you knew you were preparing for. And I just got in the habit of writing it down and over the years I've continued. And uh, I, I must say, Catherine was a little mistaken when she, I checked my log when I got back. It's not 75,000. It's 70,180. Okay. Close, Close enough. enough. <laughs> yeah. And so now, you, now you have, and, and how many children did you have? Two. Two. So so Catherine and? Fred, our son. And Fred. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Fred Jr. Fred Ju- Fred, Fred third, actually. And what was it like? I'm going to switch it over because the reason why I, I invited her to this pod- podcast because I would be so intimidated. I mean, how did you ever date a guy when your when <laughs> right. your dad was a DI, a Marine who is who they write books about him? Yeah. What was that like? In fact, I <laughs> rifles by the front door. Did, Just a little reminder, but friendly. We right, were right, always right, called right. the Smiling Fagans. Everybody yeah. loved Big Fred, and okay. my my girlfriends just adored him. And but yeah, it was intimidating. Keep well, in mind, I, we moved a lot, so. When, when I was in high school, we got to be two years in Atlanta, Georgia, and that was great for me. And, yeah, we had friends come over, and I dated. But one time I stepped out of line. I remember the one time, and I remember coming home and the crossed arms by the front door, the oh, wide no. stance. Right. And I 
You I, just I knew really you were in trouble. I didn't. <laughs> I was pretty good. I was a pretty good girl. At least I, I agree. think I, I agree. But one time, I try. I got pulled in by my friends to sneak out or something. Or I was out later than I was supposed to be. But the discipline, the way I was raised, it, it is who I am today, and it, I love the way I was raised because not the the love, but also the discipline. The discipline helps you be a. Do you know what I you love are, about this? You, you are a real estate agent. I am. And I've seen your show. And I've seen <laughs> I don't your, have a show. But, but, well, the, the thing is, I've seen your work ethic. Thank you. And you do not stop. I think you, you work for the Mercer Group. I want to do a shout out for you because yeah. it's Thank highly, uh, if you want a good agent, I'm going to tell you, and right. I'm a broker, okay? So hey. she'd be considered like competition, but I'm telling you that she is an awesome agent. And if you, and if you follow her, you will learn. Uh, just how good she is. And that work ethic, I think you got part of the DNA from your father because you so. don't stop working. <laughs> no. I, 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 every well, time. how do we get in touch with her? So, Work yeah. hard, play hard. How do we get in touch oh, with you? Uh, yeah, my Instagram is Fagan Cat. Fagan Cat. And. Okay. You want to spell yeah. it? F Yes, F-A-G-A-N-C-A-T. And um, then, I'm, yeah, I'm on all the other ones, the LinkedIn and the Facebook and the And you work for the YouTube. Mercer Mercer Group? Yep. I'm yeah, I'm with Keller Williams, but, and then Patrick Mercer. We have yeah. a Mercer Group on Adams Avenue yeah. in Kensington. And, and Patrick is only, and I've worked with Patrick. Right, he's a good guy. Yeah, super he's high professional. That guy is. Sharp woo, cookie. Sharp yep. cookie. What's your phone number in case anybody wants to give you a call? Yeah, oh, do thanks, a shout out. Mark. It's 619-806-2284. One more and time. And for your One convenience, more time. Yeah, it spells cat. C A T H spells cat. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So six one nine eight zero six two two eight four. And I want to do that because we can vouch for your work ethics, yes. and you Thank do take you. after your I father. Twenty seven years. I've been just, almost twenty eight. In oh boy, yeah. wow. You know one well, of the nicest things about this interview. Yeah, I, I know what you're going to say. Is the father, love between daughter. the father right. and daughter? Because yeah. <laughs> I have a do I have we two do. daughters. Oh. Frank has two daughters. <laughs> we do. And when you see this, it's. It's just, way back. it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a, it, is it is special. The and bond it, between a father right. and a daughter, yeah. very good. And we've all been at, at certain events where I see you guys together and you bring your father and, and uh, I see how tight you are and you get you get to joke with him and he, and yeah, he loves you. Yeah, we're friends. And, it's, and, and, it, and it inspires me uh, with my connection with my with my girls. And, uh, it I changes. Look up to it. it wasn't always, you know, I, I wasn't not, well, intimidated well, as a look, I mean, in a nice way, but I always have respected both my parents. I called them ma'am and sir yeah. all my life it's just the way I was raised but yeah now and we're friends but I still always of respect course. of course <laughs> yeah you have to that's what he said you don't have to uh, love them and you don't have to right. do this but you gotta I respect do. them but you do love them <laughs> and that's shining. and Fred did you have you wrote anything anyone can read is there something out there yet are you working on something because you I should. think you, you know listen I wanted to do this interview to historically put this because you are an American hero and, well, and, I'm and flattered, Frank, that you would say that. Well, you but you are. are. You, you, you really took, are. You took kids into battle. Mm -hmm. And I know you'd take a bullet for any of them. And especially your second tour when you got a little emotional because now you're going, I'm not only responsible, I am the lead. And these kids are my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that you would do everything. And, and, and uh, I'm not going to compare myself with you, but I've, I've been in situations where as a sergeant, I had to perform. First, if we're going to jump out of a helicopter, I'll go and mm -hmm. then have them catch up so mm -hmm. they know I'll do anything I ask them to do. But in war, when you're asking them to uh, potentially take a round and you're going in there first, especially the fact that you about six foot, how old, six four? How six old? four. You're mm -hmm. six four going into a, a tunnel designed for a five foot, 120 pound, uh, you know, <laughs> north, <Little>. yeah, <laughs> man. And you're going down there three times. Shows me right now what kind of a leader you are, and I have a, a, a even a higher demand of respect for you, and right. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Frank. And I think that that's going to wrap it up. For yeah, now. Catherine. Catherine is uh yeah is got to go. Yeah, got to go show some property. Yeah, but I'll tell you what. We could have went on oh, for another hour. We could have went on for another two hours. You see hours. what I mean? We have to stop the interview because she has to right. go work. Okay, <laughs> there's a work right. ethic. So right Frank, there. tell them tell them what we're going to do now. Well, I'd like you to click and subscribe and come to our channel and yeah, is it, this on youtube also by the yeah, way it's on yeah on youtube okay it's, it's, uh, I'm, on you, I'm getting on youtube yeah just to the number two let you know because what we do is we talk about all sorts of things Wait, it's, it's called just to let you know yeah, yeah. just With to let two. you know just to let okay. you know we're going to talk about this i like that yeah, yeah. just to let you know okay i'm and gonna, did you I'm gonna subscribe else? you if you subscribe me
Oh, so absolutely. We'll go back and forth. Now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you can hear us on all all the various uh, podcast platforms. We're on Spotify, YouTube, all of them. So you can listen to us when you're driving. And uh, this is an especially intriguing show because I agree with Frank, Fred. You are definitely a hero. You may not think you're a hero. <laughs> and that makes him more of a hero. <laughs> and that Exactly. Right. Because Very you just humble. said, I right. did what I had to do. Right. And that puts you in a completely different category. Okay, thank you right. so much. Thank you. Thanks for thank, you. Us. thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. Just to let you know, the Powell Brothers. <laughs>